Uh, take it away, sir. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I hope I am holding the microphone correctly. Let me know. I haven't had my rock star training today, so I hope you can hear me from the back. Um, thanks, thanks uh, for inviting me. Uh, I know that I'm probably not the most typical attendee of the conference. I'm uh, thinking throughout the day while seeing all the talks. I hope I have enough codes in the slides. Uh, but I code. I could code quite a lot in our group. Um, and uh, I think I'm quite excited to tell you what we're working on uh, at AstraZeneca. Um, I can tell you we may not be as far along in the journey as some of the other companies that are here in the journey to data analytics or unified data analytics, as we see as the tag. But it's certainly not because of the quantity of data or the need. And, uh, and we're working actively to change that from within. So I'll start a little bit on why we're here uh, and uh, maybe start a bit with a, what is a bleak picture of uh, why are we here in the first place. Direct discovery is a really hard problem and it doesn't seem that more data, more time, or more money really solves it. We've been hard at work, uh, but it's basically, it costs a fortune. We're really, 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 really bad. Even though we're getting better, marginally better, we're still quite bad at choosing things in the dark space that is biology. Things that will end up working to be drugs. And we want to get better at this because if we can find a biological entity that we think potentially can be affected or changed with the drug, we have the ability to affect millions of people and millions of patients and potentially treat them earlier, at least let them lead a better life. Uh, we also, um, you know, historically have done not very well. We pick things and because it takes so long to figure out whether we are successful and because it is expensive and it's a large process, it takes 10 years to figure out if you're right. Two thirds of them usually fail and not only for efficacy sometimes, also for just time, too much time has elapsed without any success. Feels a bit like software development actually, uh, but just much, much, much more slower. So uh, this, we've tried to turn out the problems. Basically we kept spending a lot of money but we don't seem to be bending the curves here. You see the number of um, kind of regulatory approvals and it's just going down. We are having trouble finding new drugs. Even though they're red, we keep spending more money. Now, like any other investment, it takes some time to bear fruit and it does, this graph stops at 2010 and it does look like we're getting a bit better. Uh, and there are some early indications this year and the previous year that we are bending the blue uh, line a little bit, but it remains hard. So many companies and AstraZeneca perhaps more vocally than others has introduced different ways, not just pouring a bunch of money, but also trying to make decisions a bit better. And uh, we have this framework where to choose a new opportunity, you not need to know whether it's good biologically, so the right target up on the right, but you also need to know that it works in the right tissue, that it's safe, that actually, you know, the commercial option is viable because if we cannot finance it for 10 years, we cannot see it through. And then that it's uh, especially targeted to the right person and the patient. And, and you'll see this paradigm in medicine where drugs are getting increasingly more directed to a specific group of people and they're not as generally developed. So we've done this and this has worked somewhat. Uh, you know, we were there before the framework got introduced and then we got better. Uh, so overall it's working. But as you can imagine, given that you are either a data engineer or a data scientist or someone that thinks about data a lot, to make more of this decision more often, we need to get really good at manipulating our data and our insight. Because all of that comes from changing ideas, but also shortening the feedback cycle and being able to tell when something is working or you have an indication that it's working a bit earlier. Currently, you give an idea to a scientist the scientist goes into the lab and maybe a year or two later they will let you know whether you were onto something. That's a feedback cycle that is hard to break. So as I said, it takes years, but it also there's just too much data. Uh, genomics is coming, terabytes, you'll hear, you've heard from Regeneron in the keynote. There is more of that same problem and many other data sources coming in. It's a good thing, but we're just not equipped for it yet. And uh, we also look at literature and we publish a lot of scientific literature. 
that's how science works. You publish an idea, some other scientists in some company or academic lab decide that's good enough for drugs, that they maybe develop it, and that continues. We don't have archive, so that slows us a little bit, but also it just takes a long time to read things that you're not an expert in, and we need to because if you're a big expert in lung cancer, you need to know what they've done sometimes in cardiovascular disease. And those two ideas, currently, we just don't connect. So we're working on the first thing by, again, setting up a lot of partnership to change experimental. So again, shortening the feedback cycle, creating new uh, what we call functional genomics tools or genomics initiative to try to read out genomics data from patients way earlier and um, figure out in biology if the things we suggest uh, are actually working. And this is the thing on the right. So putting it in cell, you may have heard of CRISPR. Make that modification into a cell. The same modification that we will be doing with a drug. Is it working? No, yes, okay, great. Let's go back to growing board. But more importantly, and this is what I'm talking about mostly today, is that uh, we are working on making better decisions. And we are targeting this, and my group in particular is targeting this by building an internal knowledge graph and then building a recommender system on top of that. Now, key to the knowledge graph is much of what we've seen today, lots of data integration across very old and sometimes not so old warehouses, uh, but then also a lot of natural language processing uh, because, as we said, there is a lot of literature out there and much of the data in biology is just typed and written, but in an unstructured way. So, uh, so why, why do I get excited about the problem? Because I think the problem of finding a drug target, uh, and drug target is that gene generally or protein in the body that you think you can uh, kind of interrupt the function of, stop it from working, so that then your disease gets better. And I think it can be formulated actually as a recommendation problem. You need to parse large amount of information. You try to make a ranking prediction. Uh, you have different models, different models, and you don't really know if it's going to succeed. Uh, and you, as new information comes in, you need to make new probability estimate. Uh, I use often to explain it internally to the company the analogy of Netflix. Uh, kind of choosing the next best target is sometimes can be compared to choosing the next best movie, just with a lot more serious complications if you get it wrong. Um, but thanks to Netflix, we now know how to treat these kind of problems. It's literally a multiple objective optimization. Uh, we have objectives, as I mentioned them before. One is finding the right target. Really, really, really complicated. You need to know what is the biology behind it. Uh, is there any biomarkers that could tell you the success in advance? What is the right tissue, the right safety, the right patient? Also, really, really, really hard. And right commercial potential. And some of the data doesn't exist. Okay, So we can, we can try to scratch the surface of right target with the data we have. We can do a very good job on tissue. Uh, but uh, commercial potential, patient safety, none of the data is, is in clean form. And so what are we doing? We're basically trying to approach this by organizing all the data and then uh, working on our, on our recommendation system. The recommendation system, as you know, just like choosing the next movie, you generally do either by asking all your friends on Facebook what movie they watched, collaborative filtering. Uh, this is probably well known to most of you, so I'll skip it quickly. What are the characteristics of the target for us or the movie by content-based filtering? And as I mentioned, we don't have a lot of data for all of this. And probably for most of the movies or targets out there, we basically know next to nothing. And that's not for lack of trying, but simply because there is the, the, the space is far larger to explore. And last, uh, uh, and this has come a lot in the recommendation system literature, we, we're working on knowledge-based filtering or using context and knowledge about the connections uh, to, to really inform your next decision. And this is what we're driving forward by kind of building a drug. Within AstraZeneca, we take uh, omics data, literature data, chemistry data, genomics data, 
both public, but importantly also internal to AstraZeneca. And we organize it into a knowledge graph. And this internal bit is kind of where the, the complication comes in the fact that much of the data in pharma or drug discovery is kept under extremely closed um, lock and key. Uh, you know, you can use irony as much as you want, but if you're a data engineer, uh, you need to be really, really, really good friends with your governance, data governance team and your IT team to actually just get the data in the first place. And you need to be able to integrate it right away with public data that lives in the open and gets continuously updated. And so as you can imagine, we, uh, we embrace uh, doing this very quickly, very often. We are not in the maturity level of needing streaming, but we definitely need to be able to run this at least every week to make sure we are in sync with the rest of the science and the world. And what we get very excited about is also doing the rest. After you've got a knowledge graph, you can extract features, you can model train, you can make recommendation, and then you can present those recommendations to the scientists, maximum three, top five, and then get down to the ones that they really want to pursue and follow up, and add the data back to the knowledge graph. So let's focus on the first bit. Uh, Most of the work done, you know, by, I, I have a picture of the people in the group. This is David that has worked on making basically a cloud scalable pipeline. Uh, you'll see many of the logos that we are all fans of here within, within the structure. We grab public input. Uh, we either make it look like something we like to operate, Parquet, JSON, or Arrow even if we get there. Uh, or we basically do all this cleaning and this ETL. And we try to ask the scientist to contribute to that part as much as possible. So we are working hard on making a, sim a system that is simple, which is where things like Databricks and being able to write notebooks comes very handy because uh, we can tell people to write notebooks to digest a new favorite data source and have it down in, now in a, in a lake where everybody else can access. We haven't experimented yet to Delta, but obviously after today, that's the first thing I'm doing after I go back. And we organize the whole pipeline, uh, run the whole pipeline in Azure, on Databricks, and we, we grab all these uh, millions of edges and millions of nodes and parse them, they duplicate them, and arrange them into what we call a graph. Now, I think if you've seen a couple of the talks around, there are two main types of graph. One is the property graph, Neo4j, Tiger graph, others, and RDF. It's, it's a bit like Democrat and Republicans. But um, we're trying to be agnostic to that as much as we can. And we're actually uh, big fans of the Graph Frames API and how Spark deals with graphs as part of their data structure. And we then project our data in these formats that would enable downstream applications. But RDF, for the things that we have, we think very causal, uh, very connections that connect uh, targets, and we know very well how they connect to diseases, but also uh, indirectly uh, things that are less sure or less safe. Uh, and obviously, you know, we need to send reports, and we send an email. We try to send an email um, that tells them what is the new data that has come in uh, related to their disease of interest or their drug of interest. And that's actually very important in an organization that doesn't love data to begin with, to kind of work on showcasing uh, an automated pipeline rapidly, shortening that feedback cycle, making sure people have in, in their inbox um, a suggestion as cha can change the equation quite a bit. So as I said, uh, we started by doing Python notebooks, we then said, okay, this doesn't scale, let's go on Spark notebooks. And just by moving straight to Databricks and the, the, the Spark framework, even sticking on PySpark, we get right away an order of magnitude improvement, job done. We then uh, open source the parsers, making sure everybody can use them and store everything on DBA, DBFS. Now, obviously, that as model has started breaking. We have realized that uh, version control is not great using notebooks. So we are trying to move some of the more structural parts 
into code that we can package libraries. We're thinking of bringing some of them to Scala, if necessary, to scale things up, particularly in pre-parsing and tagging some of the literature we have to deal with. But overall, Databricks has worked well as a, as a prototyping and a, as, a, as a first development tool. Uh, it's, the pipeline is really organized as a series of notebooks in which the team, team of eight now, works on it together, does pull requests and changes things. Uh, we have parsers for every one of the data sets we need. We have the duplicators. And we then have things that uh, help us you know, grabbing that memory structure or data structure that we have defined and mapping it down to projections. And projections is how people use the graph. So for example, a scientist in uh, lung cancer may want to know overall what's going on with lung, but they're really interested in lung cancer in specific focus and targets specifically. And so they will then have a projection and a filtered view of that graph on which they will work on. It is important that view maps back to the full one, so that if they decide to design an algorithm down on their subgraph, they can then parse it on the very top and, and, and launch it on the larger graph later. But that, that ability to grab and wrap their head around the, biologic, uh, the biological description of a single graph is quite important. Um, you know, we, uh, as I said, we kind of have a uh, dashboard that gives us a bit of metrics and tells us where we're going. That's been very useful as well to do on the, on the fast. And um, we, we save the structure in, in basically a set of files. We output it. We've modeled ourselves after another project that does this in literature, also coming from Microsoft, called the Microsoft Academic Graph. Um, their output is very much a set of files, maybe parquet or arrow, something friendly. And they, um, you, what you ultimately want when you see the set of files is a node dictionary. So an ability to see which nodes do you have and how do they map to the rest of the data that is out there. What I, these mappings are saved in a list that we use. We obviously uh, load in memory, use as an index throughout the execution of the pipeline. But that is useful to then give out to our scientists because then they can map their favorite data set to this. And we also try to take into account directionality, which is something that can be done in property graphs or not. But we want to do it at least at this level of abstraction so that then we are able to potentially go down the property graph route or the RDF route. Um, we also have all the edges, and this is where the meat of the problem is. As you extract things from literature or from databases, you're connecting things to things. It might be a gene to a disease. It might be a compound to a protein. We're saving all these, and we're continuously updating them as people add them, and we're able to filter and look. And this is really where, where people get the most uh, kind of interested. They want to capture their internal knowledge into this format. And part of the reason to do it as a graph is because biology gets represented all the way from when you studied as an undergrad or even in high school in terms of graphs. And so it's a very intuitive way for them to explore and to understand. So even when we train a black box model on top of that, the first thing our data scientist or bioinformatician will do is go back to this table and check what's behind it. What are the edges that could connect the two things you are suggesting in your uh, deep learning black box? And obviously, we keep everything we can. Uh, in, in when we, once we restructure this, we have either links or the full context from the original sources captured so that we can extract and use it. So uh, all right. but. As I said, if you try to do this with just the databases out there, yes, there is the famous one, the genomics one are getting really good, and there's a lot of data, but the graph will be incredibly sparse. And if you start looking at rare diseases or diseases where there hasn't been any work before, you will not find the thing. So what we try to do is to fill the rest of the graph using literature. Most of the science still gets written in papers. So there is an enormous amount coming from either patents, journals. And I wish this was a complete map of all the formats that you get to touch, but it's so not. There's PDFs is the standard. 
uh, table. Every journal has their own format. So the whole thing gets really, really complicated. Um, and in there, there's tables, images, and things that we would like to grab. So we started from text. We are like, OK, let's go and try to toggle the entities. This has been tried multiple times, done multiple times. Take all of Medline, 60 million abstracts, which updates weekly. Find all the entities. Find things that look like entities, or maybe adjectives attached in front of the entities. And that's something that we can come back maybe in the questions. Um, and try to link them back to the knowledge graph or to whatever maps and IDs we have. We then kind of extract this information and try to connect them using either syntax or the connection that they might have. And yes, you see some of the favorite NLP libraries is there. We also use a lot PyTorch, Hugging Face, um, Transformer library. Um, uh, and so uh, whether we use it with the Spicy Transformer library or not. But this is, you know, we have a workhorse library, which is the one that basically tags and extracts the baseline and tries to fill most of the graph, most of the entities, capturing whatever we can. We, have tra we are training named entity recognition models to do this. But for every entity, we need to train a different one. And so we are establishing a, a notation pipeline internal to the company that we can then open source to try to create open source data sets of what is a good entity for protein-protein interaction and what is not a good entity. Any NER model you, you bring from the outside to pharma breaks miserably. And that's partially because the way people write chemical structure, biological structure, interaction, is extremely complex and changes. So we're training specific model to do that. We're having good success. We're using transformers. Uh, we are also kind of uh, training specific transformers model to do relationship extractions. So we're engineering new heads on top of BERT or BioBERT to extract uh, these uh, these relationship at scale, and that's where we are hoping to then uh, be able to you know do distributed training, but also distributed evaluation of models uh, to be able to do this over all our data. And obviously, the kind of the most appetizing goal is being able to repro reproduce what we can do in the public very well, train the models there, but then transfer them to things that have been written inside. So clinical trial, summaries, uh, anything we have written in a document or a PowerPoint. You'll be surprised how much PowerPoint goes on in pharma. That is actually where we store a bunch of the knowledge. And we need to be able to extract it uh, because we think we're sitting on a gold mine. 13 plus years of people exchanging opinion about whether a target is good or not for a disease. So we have grabbed uh, kind of off the shelf uh, solution to do NER to have a baseline. And we've scaled them on Spark so that we can do this in minutes. Uh, this has been really useful. We are doing the same thing for our NER transformers model. Um, and uh, you know, R Richard um, is a, while a fan of Spark, has had some problem with the, with the JVM, but the Databricks folks are working on it. But we have, we've been able to at least move this in scale over you know, something that takes minutes and, and has a much more efficient processing. Uh, we are now thinking of using syntax and going back to a bit to rules. Transformers are great. They seem to be working. But we think there is a, a, some merit in using an hybrid approach in which we can bring a bit of rules to make sure at least we filter things that we're really sure are not going to be relationship between a gene or a disease, for example. And this comes from the fact that in biology, there are some such genes uh, that can be called things like great or fly. or And so it, it, it doesn't help the whole uh, transformer model trained on Wikipedia to, um, uh, <laughs> to disambiguate this. And so I think we can actually gain quite a bit of work in, in, in trying to disambiguate this. Also, for named entity, we get a lot of these cases where you get this qualifiers added to the uh, to the name. You get a breast cancer, yes, but it's a her positive. And I can guarantee you no ontology or control vocabulary will keep up the pace 
of scientists inventing new qualifiers and clinicians inventing new qualifiers every week. So we need to be able to map those entities and figure out that HER2 positive is a subtype of breast cancer. And so we're working a lot with dip type and other approaches in entity linking to link this, um, uh, this kind of new uh, nodes into the graph in the right structure at the right hierarchical level. So, but it does work. When we grab everything from literature and we kind of map it to um, uh, the, 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 the graph, we are actually able to decrease the sparsity tremendously. And this seems to be working really well. There are a few startups and a lot of big companies uh, that are now working on getting new targets using these systems. We're partnership, we have a partnership with one, as you've seen from a previous slide, but there's many that are trying to do this for rare diseases where they have no data and they're trying to figure out what works in lung cancer and map it back to some ataxia that has never been worked and has only 10 patients. And that's a very important problem because a, a pharmaceutical is very happy to develop a drug for 10 patients if it's not so expensive and so long to get there. Uh, you can look more at this starts from an academic effort. We started while I was working at Open Targets. Me and Andrea Pierleoni, who now works in one of these startups, and, and in, we're now continuing this uh, both in our ways. We also are, uh, as I mentioned, trying to using transformers quite a lot. We have uh, just engineered a new head for BERT. We're contributing back to Hugging Face. And uh, the next bit will be to either distill the model so that we can uh, really evaluate it over all these documents or distribute and, uh, and really, really flex the spark muscles uh, and the Horovod muscles. Um, even though it's quite difficult, it's, it's a quite a hard jump to do sometimes when you know that whatever you deploy will probably be outpaced in the next two, three months. Just a little background on why do I say this. In Transformers, this is a library that in the past eight to six months has taken flight. It, uh, it embraces all these very large models and allows to work in a single framework. But the leaderboard, the NLP leaderboard that these models are generally trained against has moved from, in 2017, to a 50% of performance. And in the span of six to eight months, we have now surpassed human performance, which is 82%. So much so that they had to create another leaderboard called Super Glue. And, and even then, we're getting close to human performance. So the progress is so fast. We've already changed you know, Facebook, Google, Microsoft. They've all trained language models. And Baidu is entering. They're all running. And so it's, very, it's something that we are not willing to go down the route of scaling things if we know that in six months, something else dramatically better may, may show up. So speed of iteration for us is still very important. Let's bring this puppy home. Um, another thing is we try to get input sentences and use that learned representation to then classify the type of the sentences. We use this in safety. So if there is a signal that we think uh, links to uh, uh, some problem with safety, uh, we, we at least filter it and then let a human review it. You may know or not if you're in pharmaceuticals, but you have, a, a, as a pharmaceutical employee, you have a duty to report any side effect of your drugs and investigate them, which is great. But it's, as you can imagine, a lot of paper, a lot of bureaucracy. And so what we are trying to do is filter down tuning for very, very, very few uh, for, a, for a high false positive discovery, but at least reducing the problem down and getting to the sentences that we think are trigger sentences to investigate. We also can cluster things and co connect biological entities, and this is what I mentioned we were doing with the deep type, trying to link entities between each other. So next bit, I know I promised of talking about recommendation systems. Maybe I packed too much in 30 minutes. I might go over by a minute. But um, once we have a graph, then we use some more Azure stuff to uh, map and learn representations from the graph. We think that learning representation from the graph is a bit better than learning representation from the tables like we used to be. And we have some data and some early investigation in academia seems to back us up. Once you learn this representation and 
this is what we use this month. Um, doesn't scale very well. So talk to me later if you're interested in doing this kind of thing. I have opinions on whether we should use PyTorch or not. But basically, you get to a point where you can um, uh, find representation and then compare them and, uh, and search. And so this is terrible search. And please don't use this to deploy any targets in kidney disease. This was just a, a, a demo. But you can now see, OK, if I input my disease in my multidimensional, multimodal graph space, what is the closest node in terms of target? And that may just be a filter, in a filter that allows you to find papers that you wouldn't have otherwise found, but that connecting before was just too expensive to do. And so uh, this is also a, um, a decision support system, not just a decision replacement system. We don't think drug discovery scientists are going out of business quite yet, but definitely one, the ones that are not going to use AI will, because the amount of data that they have to parse is too large. Um, so I guess to close, what have we learned? We learned that Spark is great. We love it. Uh, Scala Spark is a lot better than PySpark. I think <laughs> a lot of talks in this, this uh, today have confirmed that you know, everybody's having a bit of problems. Um, but maybe Aro will save us all. Being able to add new data quickly helps the feedback. I think uh, feedback and trust in pharma is imperative, partially because the company is 90% dominated by people that do not like computers. Sorry if you are listening, but I, do, I doubt they're going to listen to the Spark Summit. And then, but you know, great things happen when they do talk to each other because I, you know, we've worked on the genetics, open targets, a portal, and a backend engineer and a statistical geneticist got together and created a phenomenal open resource in a few months that scales at infinitum and it can be used by anybody. And um, Ultimately, it's quite important that we dose just how much AI we give back to the scientists. This is a lesson we are learning, and uh, we'll, I'll report back uh, next year. And last, and just leaving it up there, we're hiring. And there's a lot of us, and I think it, it's just going to get bigger. But these are some of the people that have helped and are helping and sponsored. So get in touch with me. I'm on many channels, but um, yeah, very available. Thanks so much. Hi, um, really enjoyed the talk. Um, you mentioned you're using graph databases and stuff, and uh, uh, I, one of the things that I understand is that in biomedical stuff, a lot of stuff is more complicated than just this affects this. So if you have a gene that affects, or a disease that affects a gene, it might be in a specific tissue or a specific, I know it's not usually just binary relationships. Do you have any ways of dealing with more complicated relationships between N entities rather than just two? OK. Um, so yes, we have, um, first of all, we don't use graph databases. We project into graph databases. And the reason why we do that is exactly that, that there are more complicated relationships. Because scientists don't really get relationships that are not drawn with a line, we have ended up having a tier of relationship, things that are definitely known, things that we think we infer. So this might be a link prediction problem in graphs, where you say, we think there is a link here. And then other connections are really just black box connections. Uh, but ultimately, we then maybe map to a database or some visualization in graph so that people can think, OK, I, I, I accept your suggestion, but I need to be working on it. And part of being able to work on it is figure out how the connection is made. Because we can't just go blindly in front of FDA and be like, well, our model says so. We're going to have to make a lot of experiments. And to design those experiments, we need to have some hypothesis. So interpretability is paramount for us. Um, we're working on a system. If you have any other suggestions, it would be great to have them. Uh, there's not, nothing we could find optimal. Any other questions? Thank you. Hi, nice talk. Um, I was wondering, it's more an opinion. So 
drug discovery has been long and everything. Now you're processing 35 years of data that has been digitized. You're processing it at immense speed, but it will still take 10 years plus to process the next targets. So in two years, what do you do? You go on pause on a sabbatical and you come back in uh, 15 years? So you see, um, that's, that's an extremely good point and the number one problem in the field. Um, it is a field that, if it has any resistance to AI, it's not just cultural, but it's, it's, it's based on times. As you see, we have, we're enjoying some of the uh, kind of collaborations to create faster biology. There is new cell line, functional genomics, and genomics uh, technologies that will allow us to read an indication earlier. Uh, it will still probably take uh, a few years to make a drug. It will take or a compound that works. That's, there are some you know, technical times that you can avoid. And testing them ultimately in the disease is the final test. Uh, and that will take, even if we shorten it, it will still take the time that it takes to grow cells or grow animals and give the animals that. But um, I think we, have, we can have early indications a lot more often. Already, Regeneron's effort in doing in genetics, we're doing, we're going around looking what people have in terms of genetic modification. And it turns out that many of these genes in the wild are already suppressed. Even if you don't give a drug, some people have this modification. When you read those modification, you can already uh, kind of try to figure out if it protects them or uh, makes the disease any worse. And by reading those indications, we can try to get an early stir. Uh, also, gener hypothesis generation continues. So this is a portfolio selection problem. It's like choosing your portfolio in stocks. Uh, you're never going to have perfect knowledge, but you continue to have to change what you think is the optimal decision. So if you think there's new data coming in in two years that s skews something to the right or to the left, maybe you shut down some other projects that you don't think are going to be successful anymore and start others. So uh, there's a lot of that going on as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, <coughs> when integrating all the sources of uh, that you use, uh, do you keep into account, for example, that there are publications that are uh, like more reliable than others, uh, there is all the reproducibility issues in research, and uh, yeah. or is something that you say we will figure it out later, or? No, um, in fact, our, our scientists usually give us a list. This is the only papers we trust. Um, difficult, to, <laughs> we can't hard code that variable, but people have tried, and we are leveraging those efforts in the past for a long time to create citation networks, and using citation network to judge impact. There is this thing called impact factor in academic literature, which can be criticized or not, but it's used. Um, and so we're, we're incorporating that to do rankings as part of our features. Um, at the moment, we are not including literature inside the graph as a citation network yet. And part of the reason is because we want to work on this kind of big matrix transformer problem approaches. And it just fits better to stay and just list the impact factor or the ranking. But once we um, give queryability or we allow the scientists to query, then that's one thing they will want to do, filter by citations, filter by connection. Uh, there are efforts like Microsoft Academic Graph I already mentioned, but then there is a semantic scholar is trying to do this at scale. And this is the people that are doing Allen NLP. So uh, other NLP friendlies. Thanks, good suggestion. Any more questions? Looks like it. Oh, sorry. Uh, I have a question. When you finish or in establishing this knowledge graph, and I could imagine that in future it will be very complicated, like different genes connect to different syndromes. And then you have like tons of hypotheses of the causation between different genes and the syndrome. And how do you prioritize the different data science projects? Yeah, so first, there are data science projects and then also biological projects. And it's even harder because the logical projects are far more expensive. Uh, so it is an optimization and a ranking problems. We are trying to use the same things that are using in recommendation system. Uh, the 5R approach is an attempt at doing that. It's saying, okay, uh, we have 10 ideas. 
which one has all these, ticks the most boxes in our checklist and has the most push under each of these parameters. And you know, we try to divide it in five dimensions because it's intuitive, but under the hood there is you know, 50 or 150 dimensions. And we try to connect features such as you know, whether the papers have been cited, it's been reproduced, sometimes even the opportunity. Do we have a model that we can try uh, that makes for an easier <coughs> test? Or can we cut this hypothesis earlier? So can we figure out something um, in, within the next month? Then let's just do that so we know and, and we close that, uh, that search path. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's an active academic and industry question on how you actually prioritize. We think we're getting better. We're making some headway. We definitely haven't cracked uh, the final formula, but work in progress. All right, uh, I think we are out of time. Uh, if you have more questions, please catch uh, LCO outside and then you know, talk to him. Uh, thank, thank you for attending. Uh, please don't forget to rate and review the session.